Namaste, assalamu alaikum. Welcome everyone to our program today. We are pleased to have people from this meeting from all over the world in different time zones. I am Shakira Mohammed of Trinidad and Tobago, a teacher for the past 15 years, and this is the 174th edition of our Zoom public meeting. We wish to sincerely thank all of you who have contributed in whatever way to the success of this ongoing Pan-Indo-Caribbean and Pan-Indian Diaspora Global Project. For 173 unbroken continuous weeks, we have been here every single Sunday, and in the past three years, seven months, and one week, we have featured 736 presenters from all parts of the world speaking on 173 topics. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a weekly forum being hosted by the Indo-Caribbean Cultural Center, a legally registered research and publishing company operating since 2010. So in order to continue this weekly program and to make it bigger and better, we are asking for your suggestions and volunteers as well as donations and you all can contact Dr. Kumar Mahabir for details. So ladies and gentlemen, our moderator this evening or tonight is again Shalama Mohammed, the co-director of this Zoom platform, who is a business teacher and researcher from Trinidad and Tobago. And she obtained her master's degree in business psychology from Franklin University in the USA. Shalama, welcome. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum. Namaste. And a warm welcome to all of you. I want to say thank you so much for choosing to be here with us today. So this public meeting will take the usual form of a panel presentation, followed by questions and comments from members of the audience. The entire program should not last more than two hours. As is usually the case, our meeting is being recorded live and would be uploaded later on YouTube permanently for posterity. The meeting is also being live streamed on the YouTube channel of the Indo-Caribbean Cultural Center. So welcome to all of you on YouTube. In order to avoid intrusions from trolls, Robin Ram Singh, our IT manager, has muted everyone. Speakers, please do not admit anyone, do not unmute anyone, and also please do not allow anyone to share your screen. Thanks for your cooperation. Our program today is entitled Maintaining Indian Identity as an Ethnic Minority in South Africa, Fiji, Reunion, and St. Vincent. Ethnic identity, I'm sure you all will agree, is a complex and multifaceted concept. It includes an individual's sense of belonging to a particular cultural group and is often shaped by a shared heritage, language, history, origins, beliefs, and values. Maintaining Indian identity as an ethnic minority in South Africa, Fiji, Reunion, and St. Vincent presents an interesting and fascinating challenge. In South Africa today, Indians constitute 1.5 million persons. That is just 2.5% of the total population. In Fiji, in the South Pacific, the estimated population of Indians today is 315,000, or 35%. On the island of Reunion in the Indian Ocean, an estimated 297,000 Indians, or 30% of the population, live there today. In St. Vincent here in the Caribbean, Indians constitute a mere 7,700 persons, or 7.4% of the total population. How they negotiate Indianness as an ethnic minority is at the heart of our discussions today. And we're going to get started with our very first speaker. She is Saranya Devan of South Africa. She holds a master's degree in Bharatnatyam from the University of Madras and another master's degree in dance from the University of Cape Town. She's a PhD student at the University of Cape Town in dance and the Indian performing arts in South Africa. Welcome Saranya. Please go ahead with your presentation for just about 15 minutes. Good evening, uh, namaskaram, namaste, and vanakkam. I hail from the east coast city of Durban in the province of KwaZulu-Natal, which is one of nine provinces that make up South Africa. While many people may not be aware of this fact, Durban has the highest concentration of Indians outside of India, and that because Indians from North and South India first began arriving at the port of Natal from India in 1860 as indentured laborers 
or grammatias to work on the sugarcane fields and as servants, cooks, watchmen, miners, and builders of railways. The South African Indian community, which comprises just 3% of the national population, punches well above its weight economically and in terms of academic advancement. Feminist qualitative sociologist Smita Radhakrishnan maintained that South African Indians gained citizenship but lost certain material privileges that reinforced the position of Indians as a buffer group between Africans and whites under apartheid. Caught between the historical power of a white minority and the contemporary power of the African minority, South African Indians face the political, political task of gaining recognition from the newly formed multicultural st state as a key minority group. This vibrant group finds itself facing an unsure future as its values and position on the landscape of South African national belonging gets eroded. Almost two decades later, after the publishing of this article by Radhakrishnan, we still note that despite abolition of institutionalized racism, South African Indians would appear to be dispensable entity in the eyes of the government. They do not seem to be one of the colors that define the proclaimed rainbow nation, a term first coined by Archbishop Desmond Tutu to describe post-apartheid South Africa in 1994. Tutu envisioned that all races living side by side with equality and harmony. Bit by bit, several scholars note that South African Indians are being airbrushed from the landscape of South African politics, business opportunities, and cultural agendas. There still seems to be petty prejudice against, against South African Indians and anything Indian. For example, when I reflect on renowned South African playwright Imbungeni in Gema, who penned an anti-Indian song, I'm in India in 2002, I'm outraged by his lyric that the reason we are faced with hardship and poverty in Durban is because everything was taken by the Indians, but they turned and exploited us. The song was banned by the Broadcasting Complaints Commission of South Africa for being hate speech, followed by a public apology by Ngema after former President Nelson Mandela also not noted his aberrance. Tikila Imbulula in 2007 was under attack for his remarks on Indian students at the University of KwaZulu Natal saying that he found the campus to be, in inverted commas, into nothing but Bombay, close uh, quotes. And that when you get into that institution, you think it's an exclusive university of Indians only. Imbulula was also forced to withdraw his statement and apologize. This evidence is anti-Indian sentiments that became more and more commonplace in the mainstream media. Matters came to head during the July 2021 civil unrest when Blacks and South African Indians clashed in the predominantly Indian township of Phoenix, located north of Durban. This again has a polarized relationships between the two racial groups and was critiqued by respected political reporter Nguyen Tosi as being an anti-Indian demography of people like EFF leader Julius Malema. As an experienced Bharatanatyam dancer, dance enthusiast, choreographer, researcher, dance critic, and theater maker based in Cape Town, South Africa, I am a third generation Indian, a born free post-1994 South African, and I am specifically of Tamil Indian descent. I'm deeply influenced by my Indian heritage and background. Bharatanatyam in South Africa is the backdrop to my study, but as I am currently on a journey of unpacking the liberation of Indian performing arts in South Africa in my PhD study, and whilst I'm aware that I'm supposed to be discussing the maintenance of the minority group of Indians in South Africa, this evening I will focus on how the Indian arts pre and post apartheid have often been given third grade status and how we begin to question how exactly do we maintain our identity and culture. According to Anomaly 1992 and 1998, Desai and Vahid 2007 and 2010, and Singh 2019, Indian dance, as in one of the other very, uh, various dance forms from India, arrived with the indentured laborers who landed in Durban in 1860s onwards. The Indian settlers, migrants from a great variety of places, regional, urban, and rural, brought with them a range of village, folk, and in traditional dance forms. 
one of these noted dance forms was Tirukuchu, which can be traced to the state of Tamil Nadu in India. As mentioned in Vasugi Singh's research, which also points to regular performance of Tirukuchu being performed at a place such as Mount Edgecombe, these performances slowly vanished from our landscape of dance in this country. Whilst Bharatanatyam made its way into South Africa in 1947 by Sharda Ongra Naidu, towards the end of the 1950s and during the 1960s, many dancers in South Africa made their way to India to further their training in Indian dance or Bharatanatyam. This went on for many years, including students who had the opportunity to study through the ICCR. With the proliferation of Indian dance teachers, so Bharatanatyam, has a, Bharatanatyam and Kathak making more frequent appearances on main stages. Typically Indian dance concerts based on stories from the Hindu epics like Ramayana, Mahabharata and Bhagavad Gita were attended in temples, community halls and schools in Indian townships and importantly, initially by Indian audiences only. The bigger and better stages and performance venues such as the Playhouse Opera Stage in the Durban City Hall were located down hall, down downtown in the cities and reserved for white performers only and with whites only audiences. The segregationist practice remained throughout the apartheid era and desegregated dance audiences only became possible from the late 1980s. Indian culture was therefore severely compromised and undervalued. It was also underfunded and poorly resourced in terms of education and performance spaces. And it was dismally promoted in terms of marketing and funding and advertising by a central government in this country. In summary, Indian dance was severely marginalized under apartheid because of the scant regard that was paid by the government of the day to the promotion of dance forms and other performing arts of Indian community. There has been widespread ignorance of the performing arts and Indian culture in general. Sorry, um, dance was not the only thing that was that got axed. Kenyan author Bungi Watingo, in his book, book Decolonizing the Mind, 1986, unpacks notions of cultural identity and the reality that, that the term race did not end with apartheid. Coming from centuries of oppression, post-apartheid South Africa, even in 2023, carries with it its progress and hope for greater inclusion and human rights. Hundreds of years of indenture, colonized mindsets and the scars of racial oppression and bigotry. The abandoning of mother tongue languages led to further questions around what role language plays in the importance and sustenance of culture. English has become the first language to a large minority of black and white South Africans. At both my primary and secondary school, we were taught in English as it was considered a powerful language positioning any other language, including Isi Zulu and Tamar, as inferior. Disregarding language may be said to be a tantamount to disrespecting another culture. A clear example of disrespecting language took place when a transforming University of Kozuri Natal removed Indian languages such as Tamil, Hindu, Telugu, Sanskrit, from its Arabic studies, uh, from its language studies from the academic program or curriculum from the year 2000 onwards. After a lengthy battle by community and cultural leaders led by retired inspector of education, Mr. P.I. Devan and the education authorities introduced Indian languages from primary school to matric level in 1984. After enjoying a few years of inclusion in the primary and secondary school curricula, Indian languages were accorded paria status by the Department of Education in, in a democratic South Africa. Students who wished to study Indian languages in school had to do this after hours. This is the current state of affairs. But Thingo urges that we find ways to bring mother tongues back. In South Africa, Black people who forsake their Africanness and mother tongue for Western influences are termed coconuts or Oreo. In other words, while they are dark skinned, they have an inner yearning for whiteness. This is a racist, offensive slur, but reflects the problem when there are clashes of culture. In terms of dance under, under apartheid, there were little to no interaction, collaboration and exchange between African, European and Asian traditions. There still prevails among some conservative South African Indians, the notion that Bharatanatyam 
will assist the second and third generations to retain an Indianness in a multilingual, multiracial, and multireligious South Africa. Thus, many dance schools attempt to teach Bharatanatyam to anyone interested. On the other hand, it will appear that many Indians prefer to align with a new South Africa and want to embrace Africanness rather than be seen to be clinging to their Indian roots. <laughs> During the apartheid years, the creative and performing arts, including dance, theater, and music, promoted the struggle against racism, injustice, and inequality. And when the democracy was attained, many aspects of the performing arts, such as Indian dance, shifted their focus from being a form of protest, where they used fusion elements and included black dancers and struggle song, song and lyrics to become a form of entertainment. With the dawn of democracy in 1994, the discourse around democracy and human rights was revised. This led to the birth of the constitution, which allowed for greater freedom for the people. According to Judge Jody, Jody Colopin, South African Human Rights Commissioner, Indian dancers have to be open-minded. Colopin wrote in open quotes, when we look at ourselves as South Africans, we face all kinds of challenges. One is our identity, who are we? Are we Indians? Are we Indian South Africans? Are we South African Indians? And culture is very important component of who we are, defining our existence. Without a doubt, we have a strong umbilical cord to our origins in India, and we should not be ashamed about that and be proud that, about that. We should wear our culture proudly on our arm, but at the same time, we should remind ourselves that we live in Africa and that our destiny is inextricably linked to the people of this continent. The constitution doesn't just require us to advance and respect our culture. It requires us to be South African, to step outside the box of our own culture and to embrace other cultures, to be enriched by those cultures that is, that is the challenge in many respects for South Africans of Indian origin in Maharaj 2019, close quotes. In the new rainbow nation that constitutes South Africa, there's a greater need for interculturalism where other cultures are explored and appreciated by those roots who, that are not in there of that culture. I've spent almost half my life as a born free, bearing witness to the dimmest discriminatory patterns that repress the artistic pursuits of my people. Under apartheid, those who are not white were denied suitable public facilities and funding for artistic and cultural pursuits. Hence, various forms of Indian dance in South Africa had very limited access to dance training spaces, and many turned to spaces such as temples and community halls for teaching and performance. As a South African Indian woman based in Cape Town in, so that in 2023, I've been questioning my identity as a Bharatanatyam dancer in the context of dance and Indian performing arts in this country I call my home. Whilst Bharatanatyam has joined other aspects of Indianness that are being airbrushed out of the Indian psyche, Indian languages in, the, in their spoken form are almost non-existent in South Africa. I ask, what can be done to ensure Bharatanatyam has a rightful place on the cultural agenda and regain, or was it ever there, its stripe in the rainbow? Thank you. Excellent, Saranya. Uh, let me just ask, what got you interested in Bharatanatyam? Given the uh, challenges that you all face there, what got you interested? I come from a very culturally inclined family. Um, and thanks to my parents, I initially was just enrolled in a dance class at the age of five. And I made it my career. Um, uh, when I finished matric, I went on to study dance and drama. And now I am currently lecturing at the University of Cape Town where I am taking our Indian drama and dance aesthetics, giving it a, a bit of a Western feel, but still trying to propagate um, our Indian um, arts um, like rasa and uh, all of this. Yeah, so we've been playing around with aspects like that. Excellent. I have several more questions for you, but preference goes to the members of the audience. So I see um, Mr. Subhash Apana with his hand up. Please go ahead, sir. You want to unmute, though? Raven, kindly unmute. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Um, 
Uh, Saranya, this uh, the the increasing popularity of uh, Malema in South Africa. Um, I my understanding is that the ANC, the message of the of the ANC has been inclusiveness. Um, at least uh, while Mandela's influence um, is, is waning, it, I believe the message is still there. The creed is still there. Um, my question is, with the increasing popularity of Malema, what does this uh, this spell for for you know the identity of, identity of of uh, Indians in in South Africa? Okay, well, we're constantly hearing these things from our you know our politicians that we are pushing towards nation building and social cohesion. Um, so that's happening on one side. And then with Malema, it's this thing of, oh, yes, all the Indians should get back to India. Um, so there's still a lot of discomfort. Um, you know, today is Heritage Day in South Africa. Uh, and as I was making my way around Cape Town today, um, I actually faced some very racial situations. And I'm thinking, how is this happening in 2023 on a day such as Heritage Day? And you're thinking, yeah, you're living in the time of Julius Malema where everyone is hearing what he's saying. Um, and especially when your universities, are, you know, your student bodies, what we call student representative councils, your SRCs, have mainly um, students that belong to the EFF, right? Julius Malema's political body. So they also have their own agenda when they are coming to the universities. And that's felt um, amongst all the different races. Um, so it's not easy, definitely not easy. Um, and you wouldn't think that it's necessarily getting any easier. Thanks, thank you. Great, thank you for sharing that. Um, Dr. Shardanan, go ahead, please. Can you unmute? Yes, uh, thank you. May I remember me the following mantra, a part of the Saranya, Triambake Gauri Narayani Namastude. Madam Sayadeji, thank you. My question to you, it is a core question for me in all my life. You have presented a lot beyond the problem of identity. You have called yourself let me ask the first one this, are you an Indian South African because you are dancing Bharatiya Natyam? Or are you a diasporian Indian? Are you South African? Who are you? And what makes you, you are the personality you are aware because your awareness is making everything. Who are you? And I'm, I'm all of that. Question to all I'm, of I'm all of that combined. Thank you. <laughs> I, I'm all of that combined. Um, I beyond Bharatanatyam, I, I yes, I, I acknowledge that I am South African, um, but I will also acknowledge my great grandfather. Uh, who who came here in 1910, um, and my 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 heritage that has come down through that, uh, and my links to to Madurai in in, in South India through that, um, and as a diaspora, um, when I speak about this this topic so uh, you know uh, passionately, um, it's because I see how things are happening in other parts of the uh, diaspora. Um, with regards to there being some sense of respect towards the performing arts. Um, and, you know, when I hear that our, you know, in our politics, we talk about the ideas of nation building and social cohesion. Why does our community or our diaspora not belong to that? Um, so I encompass everything that you just asked me. I'm a South African, I'm an Indian. Uh, and yeah, I, I hope that answered your question. Well, it, it's a very it, big topic. <laughs> call, it, call it awareness, call it mind. But when you are shopping in the mall, there are a lot of races, there are African, Creole, Japanese, I don't know. What do you feel in a shopping mall? Are you an Indian? Are you, we are calling ourselves Hindustani? Are you an African? 
what is your feeling? What are you aware about? And what are you going to tell your and your your your, your children and grandchildren and so go on? That is a very core question. Take this very serious. Correct. Correct. And, and we have to work together uh, uh, around this because I am writing in my book about homogenization of the awareness. You know, you are busy to find a balance between all the identities are living in your mind. But when you are in the street, you are an Hindustani, you are an Indian, oh, that is walking and pulling on an Indian. Isn't true? It is a very big problem and we have to solve this problem together. Mm. Because I was born in Suriname, lived there for the last 50 years, I'm living in Holland. I'm living in Portugal and passing Paris, <laughs> Au Revoir, something like that. So who am I? When I am in Portugal and I, I want to explain to you, I am a Dutchman. Ah, black boy. Oh, you are a Dutchman. You are an Indian. You say, okay, <laughs> just like you want. This, this, this question is, is globally a problem for, for us all. Yes, Dr. Shardanan, um, I agree with you. Thank you Correct. so much. There's so many identities to to be um, that that are intertwined into one. So it's it's a big topic, and and it's something definitely that needs to be um, unpacked further. Thank you. And I think time and place also affects that. Yes. Let's move Thank on you. to our third person who would like to ask a question. Jay Nile, go ahead, please. Hi, excellent presentation, Soranya. <laughs> First one that I heard in uh, being in exile from a person who's got passion about the situation in South Africa. It's just like the days that when we fought the struggle. Now, one question, are you connected to P.I. Devon? Yes, that's my grandfather. Oh my God, <laughs> now I know where the seeds come from. Excellent. You are carrying his, uh, what he called, burden of finding the Indian identity in the South African context. You are a South African. You are a South African of third or fourth generation Indian because you didn't choose to be born in South Africa, right? So when anybody asks you who you are, you first say, I am a South African of Indian descent, period. Whether they like it or they don't like it, that's the uh, thing. Because when I tell people in Canada, I still have that identity problem. I say, I am a South African. I am a Canadian, South African of Indian descent. Because I am second generation uh, Indian of indenture because my father came as a indentured laborer in 1911. So having said that, what your presentation gives a power to people of your generation to go and grasp this and get into the system. And I hope you can run for politics because that is where your grounding is. You, have, you are passionate and I'm sure part of your presentation today is going to be part of your PhD thesis. I can see that through because there is passion there. There is, oh, excellent. I, I'm, I'm happy that there's somebody there who is carrying and picking the banner of uh, resistance because the Malemas can come and go because Malema was my generation and he was in the ANC and he was taught there. So he was a youth league leader. So having all these uh, you know, people just go through the education department and go through the heads of department, because I know it's a mess. So my, uh, what you call support for you is I am here. I am accessible to any idea, any values, anything that you want, 
in your struggle to find our identity. And coming to the diaspora part, we are part of the colonial diaspora. The colonies, the colonial powers brought us. And to answer the doctor, we are, Michel, you haven't been chosen to be in South Africa. It's your grandfather that did it. And he was brought in by the colonial powers. So I was born in South Africa in Durban. I wasn't born by choice. My grand, my father came from India. My mother was a second generation also because her grandfather came, her father came from India. So having all this, you have a good idea of what an Indian and use the Bharatanatyam, use dance to attack this. Great presentation, keep it up. And Thank uh, you so much. Uh, I know PI very well. <laughs> you know, I grew up because I was a teacher too. Thank okay, you very great. much for that presentation. Thank you very much, Mr. Nair. We have one final question for you, Surania, and that is from Mr. Manek Bujwala. Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, thank you. A very good presentation, uh, very informative. Uh, my question was that is some of this racial antagonism coming because of in the past, you know, the Indians uh, having been used to the caste system hierarchy, you know, they probably treated the Africans, you know, as a lower caste uh, people. And maybe that is the memory of that, that is causing them to be racist. And the other question is about how many intermarriages are happening uh, between Indians and Africans and, uh, you know, what is the impact of, is that, is that having a positive impact on improving relations? Um, okay, so the second question, the intermarriages, there's a lot of intermarriages that take place in, uh, in South Africa. Uh, the number of it is increasing, but there's a lot of it that where there are actually couples leaving the country. So there aren't many that are in the country as inter, uh, uh, intercultural relations. Um, unless it's maybe a lot that, that you find in Cape Town itself, you don't see many in, in Johannesburg and, and, and Durban. Um, with regards to your first question, that's something that we could think about. Maybe it is this idea of the cost, but then it's also, it's so many years later, do we really think that the caste system could have been carried on so many years later um, by, by our fourth and fifth generation Indians? So maybe that's something just to think about. Oh, thank you. So wonderful, Saranya. Your presentation was fantastic. And uh, we want to thank you so much for having been here with us. Thank you so much, everyone. And thank you so much to the Indo-Caribbean Cultural Center for giving me this opportunity. I will also touch base with all the other organizations as part of my PhD study, um, because I will be making trips to other places of diaspora. So thank you very much. Very good. So we'll help in whatever way we can to connect you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So ladies and gentlemen, our second speaker, is none other than Dr. Subhash Apanam of Fiji. He's a public sector reform specialist, the chair of the Boxing Commission of Fiji, as well as a weekly columnist in the Fiji Times who writes on cross-cultural studies, race relations, identity, and belonging. Dr. Apana, please go ahead with your presentation for 15 minutes. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you for having me on your program. Um, I, I would like to, to uh, firstly acknowledge uh, an ex-teacher of mine who is, who is Zooming into this session, Mary Sweeney. Hi there. She taught me when I was a um, secondary school student back in the island that I come from. Now, because uh, uh, the, uh, um, the first speaker, uh, Sarania, mentioned a little bit about uh, upbringings and different identities and all that stuff. I would like to start off with a, a little bit of uh, background and how I, um, on me, and how I um, experienced uh, um, a differentness, if you like. Um, I come from a, an island, uh, a small island in Fiji, 
Uh, I was born in a Fijian village. Fiji has two major communities, Fijians and Indo-Fijians. So uh, for, for a person of Indian descent to be born in a Fijian village is, is a little bit of a rare experience. Okay. Now at the time, I knew that I was different. I knew that I was Indian, but it didn't feel bad. I didn't feel unwanted. I didn't feel different. Okay. Then I went to our local school for primary education. And over there, uh, children from both backgrounds were there. It's a multiracial school. Uh, everything was okay. And I moved to the next school, which is a secondary school. And suddenly I realized that being Indian was something very, very different. And there was something wrong with me. Okay. So there was bullying and so on and so forth. Uh, then when I came to Suva for higher education, I stayed with my, my auntie for, for a year. And uh, see, my, my, my father is South Indian and my mother is North Indian. Okay? It was a rare union uh, in the 1960s. Um, it was not, not common to have that kind of uh, South Indian marrying a North Indian. It was almost a no-no at that time. Uh, there's a story behind it, but uh, we'll leave it for the time being. Um, so I stayed with my North Indian auntie and I realized that I was South Indian. Okay? Because there was constant reminding going on that you are South Indian. You speak a little bit differently. You like different types of food that we don't like and so on and so forth. Your, your taste buds are different and so on and so forth. Uh, not necessarily bad, but it made me feel like there was something wrong with me. Okay. And then, of course, when we, we, when we enter the real world, we, we, we talk about politics and all that stuff. And Fiji has been riddled with coups. Race-based justifications have been used repeatedly for coups in Fiji. And so, you know, like uh, this is the, the reality of uh, the situation of the Fiji Indian, if you like, or the Indo-Fijian. I'll now take a share my slides with you. Okay. Um, so that's basically what I want to present. Uh, a, a relevant background on Fiji, relevant for this topic. Um, provide a historical brief on the challenges faced by Indians in Fiji. Uh, discuss key issues around the concept of identity in multicultural contexts like Fiji. Uh, multicultural and also identity is linked to access to resources, access to opportunities. That's something that I'll talk about later on. Uh, and to highlight and discuss key issues that we need to be careful about when discussing identity. So that's Fiji, a, a brief glimpse of Fiji. Um, population is 939535, three, so almost a million. In 1977, 42% of the population were Fijian, 50% were Indian, and the total population was 600,000. Now, in other words, the Indians dominated demographically. And this is one of the reasons why the first coup was held, fear of Indian domination. Okay, we were in the professions, we were in commerce, and there was this um, belief amongst the Fijians that political power must remain in their hands and that uh, Indians could not be trusted in positions of power of that sort. And so that's the reason why we had the first coup of 87, very briefly. After that, of course, migration, um, you know, Indians started looking elsewhere, Fiji Indians started looking elsewhere. And this is the population uh, uh, distribution at this uh, 2021, 57% Fijians, they have now, re-identified themselves as Itoke. The word Itoke means uh, custodians or owners of the place. And we have 38% 30, in the Fijians. And this, the migration trend continues. Okay, so the, these, these proportions will change over time. In fact, I had at one stage predicted, I think it was in 1999, that I predicted by the, that by the year 2020, we will be just around 30% in Fiji. Uh, but unfortunately or fortunately, at this point in time, we sit at 38%. Religions, Christians make up 64.5%, Hindus 27.9%, and Muslims 6.3%. Okay, so uh, in terms of religion, we have a compact Hindu grouping. Um, the identity that we, we carry with us is the Grimiti identity, which is, you know, the, the indentured labor identity. And it's, this is in some ways receding into the past. Recently, we had a, an international conference here in Fiji. Many people from the Indian diaspora, from Guyana and Trinidad and Tobago and so on and so forth, they, they attended 
uh, and I met uh, a lot of people, made contacts with them. Uh, I unfortunately I don't see any of those names in the list of uh, people who are who are uh, zoomed on to to this uh, this presentation. Uh, so I just like to share with you uh, a, a little data that we, uh, we we picked up in 2017. This is a survey that I conducted with a, a colleague of mine. It's a sample size of 60 USP students. We we're just interested to know you know where Grimit sits in the psyche of of the present generation. And so um, to the question, how is your knowledge of Grimit? How much do you know about Grimit? 40% said that it's very poor or poor. Uh, and to the, to the question, um, is knowledge about Grimit important? 72% said it's very, are they very important or very important? And to the question, is it important? Is Grimit important to Fiji? 78% said it's important or very important. But the thing here is that the level of knowledge about Grimit, which of course is linked to identity, is very limited. Very limited. Okay, and of course, it is, the fact that we don't have a reading culture anymore doesn't help. Okay, so so ident different identities that we've had over time, we were seen as coolies, you know, in the beginning. Um, the arrival began in 1879, and it uh, uh, it uh, stopped in 1916, 1879 to 1916. So we were seen as coolies, and then in 1946. We were termed, uh, called, given the tag Indians. That, that was for the purpose of the 1946 census. Later on, in 1970, when we gained independence, we were called Indo Fijians. Okay, we, it's, it's, it's something that we accepted, and it became the term that was used to refer to us. Uh, in 2013, we were given constitutionally the ca uh, categorization of Fijians of Indian descent. So this is the tag that we got: Fijians of Indian descent. Now, this, this little thing that I have here, Kaindia, is a, is a Fijian term that is used to refer to us to, to emphasize our differentness or separateness. And it is used very often during political upheavals. Okay. Um, I had initially used the word here, hobbled by, but I changed to distinguished by. These are physical features, lifestyle, food, attire, religion, language, music, cultural practices. Um, all of these things clearly show that we are a distinct and different grouping within Fiji. Okay. Of course, there are places where changes are happening, and I'll talk about that in the, in the end. So the, historically, this is what, what, what our, our stay in Fiji has been like. Struggle for existence in the beginning as indentured laborers. So gradually in the plantations, long working hours, meager pay and so on, and very poor working conditions, subsistence, uh, uh, living and so on and so forth. Then we began to struggle for legitimacy. And so in 1921, um, that's 1879 to 1921, we didn't have any political representation. 1921, we had a um, appointed member, a member who was appointed by government. And from there onwards, our representation and participation in politics increased. And then. Of course, we were the biggest grouping of workers, the main grouping of workers, because we were in the sugar industry and that was the biggest industry in the country. So there was worker agitation going on there. Um, um, uh, sorry, has it moved? Worker agitation going on there. The um, contracts were all one-sided uh, until uh, 1960 when um, the, Den Demi the Denning Award clearly um, outlined that uh, the system had been stacked against the Indian Indians who were working in the sugar plantations. Okay. Um, next, it was a struggle for recognition, a separate identity. I mean, like when we talk about identity, we have to be very careful that there's an ethnicity and there's a nationality. Okay, so two different things. So like uh, some of the speakers earlier, had, Mr. Nye had, had said earlier that, yes, I'm a Fijian of Indian descent in Fiji. Okay, I'm a Fijian of Indian descent. Um, the problem here is that when we emphasize ethnicity, it has political implications. And, and by political implications, I mean implications in terms of access to resources and opportunities. Okay. Um, we have now renewed uh, our focus, uh, the, the present government. We have uh, Grimit celebrations. It's now a public national holiday. We used to have Grimit cel celebrations before, but they were like small time affairs rather than national affairs. This is now a big deal in Fiji. Okay, I don't know for how long it'll last, but we had a, a um, uh, some sort of a, a, a mega budget uh, that was used to to celebrate and, and highlight Grimit. 
And this is the first time in which there was a lot of ethnic Fijian participation in our functions. And, and they learned a lot. And the papers carried the news media, all of that carried this thing. And lastly, struggle for acceptance. This is, a, this is a, the most difficult hurdle that you find uh, amongst us. And I believe it's shared amongst the Indians in other, other places. Um, we have here, just like in South Africa, Malema, we have emergence of ethno-nationalists. They have been around since 1970s, but they have increased and they become more sophisticated in their demands and what they expect, okay? Um, there are sensitivities like, uh, you know, sometimes we are referred to as visitors. This, is, this was the latest storm uh, that, that uh, kicked up uh, in, uh, in late last year, in September last year. Uh, and then, of course, we had the elections in December. So I started writing on this, this term, Vulangi. Vulangi means visitor. Okay. So the question that arose is like, if you refer to us as Vulangi or visitor, does that mean that our existence here is transient? Or do we belong? Okay. Unfortunately, um, culturally, Fijians refer to Fijian usage of the term Vulangi is not as heavily politically loaded as we make it out to be. Like, for example, if we have 14 provinces in Fiji, if someone from province A visits province B, Fijians refer to that Fijian as Vulangi as well. But of course, we, we uh, do not acknowledge that. And largely because we do not understand uh, Fijianness. I'll, I'll speak about that shortly. Okay. Um, so that's the next point, lack of knowledge about an understanding of the, of the other. We do not speak their language. Not too many of us speak their language. I do, largely because of my background. Um, we do not understand their cultural ceremonies, their practices, and so on and so forth. Um, attempts are being made, but it's been too slow and uh, very late in coming. Okay. Now, expanding on that point on lack of understanding of the other, um, conditions of existence historically, they lived in villages, we lived in settlements. Okay, and, and uh, laws prohibited us from living in villages. And over time, it became the way of arranging people. So even today, you hardly have any Indians living in Fijian villages. Um, language, customs, cultural practices, like I, I uh, mentioned. Now, the other thing that's happening these days is that in settlements, we have multiracial mix-ups, okay? People are living together. So the shared conditions of existence that give rise to cross-cultural understandings is on the rise. It is increasing, but it'll take a bit of time to, to have better understanding of the other in larger numbers. Um, so this, this has resulted in a lack of cross-cultural respect. Um, in the 1970s, um, Fijians, Fijians saw Indians as business-minded, um, how do you say, acquisitive, um, um, individualistic, inward-looking, and so on and so forth. And uh, Indians looked at Fijians as indolent, um, wasting time, uh, unfocused, and so on and so forth. And they, these are stereotypes, stereotypical understandings. Um, these are changing at this point in time, but we still need to work towards generating cross-cultural respect in larger numbers. And that can only come from understanding, okay? Um, the, the competition politically has been ethnically uh, based. Like uh, we have uh, the National Federation Party, which purports to be a multiracial party, but in fact, it is heavily Indian, has historically been heavily Indian, and then now uh, still is, okay? So, and, and the, then we have Fijian political parties. So that doesn't help in this, this area of, uh, of bridging the divide. Um, and also when, whenever we have uh, uh, political upheavals, we have demarcations, you know, it's Fijians against Indians. Uh, that's why I asked uh, uh, about South Africa and I said that, uh, you know, uh, about Malema. I, I believe that uh, the um, Fijian politics um, will continue to be a problem. Fijian politics, I'm talking about ethnic Fijian politics. And because of that, we will have upheavals, politica political upheavals, uh, because they are divided um, tribally, uh, provincially, and so on and so forth. Um, 
zero sum thinking whichever equation you look at resource allocation access to opportunities um allocation of this and allocation of that and all that stuff we have a, we have increasingly moved towards a spoiled system right now we have a coalition government but it's a weak coalition government okay and every now and then there are demands being made on the government we want this one luckily i mean i uh, remarkably the indian side is not making any demands at all okay and they've been very solid in their support which is a refreshing uh, and and good uh, a positive uh, development in fiji politics that's the number of coups we've had two in 87 one in 2000 one in 2006 one in 2009 okay so there've been coups in fiji lots of coups some, sometimes uh, people uh, sarcastically refer to fiji as kuku land okay i've i've, I've got this from the net so it's not very important, but what is important is the last two points. Identity undergoes change. Identity undergoes change. Over time, it will change. You know, as we acquire the way of thinking, the lifestyles of others around us, identity will, will gradually change. We will remain as Indians. Of Indian descent is the term. But our thinking will have changed. Our outlook on life will have changed, and so on and, and so on and so forth. And the last point here is identity is perceived versus felt versus institutional. So you have the institutional tags like Fijians of Indian descent. And then how do we feel? I think that was the question that was asked by, uh, by Mr. Singh there. So how do you feel? Do you feel Fijian or do you feel Indian or do you feel like the other? Um, for me to answer that question, there are times when I do make the transitions. There are times when I feel very Fijian, like for example, eh, with the Rugby World Cup happening right now and the FIFA all over the place, Rugby FIFA all over the place, and Fiji having a rampant team, a good team, very good team, with a good chance of progressing. The whole of Fiji thinks like Fijian. Okay, so that sports bring us together. And then of course, when suddenly it comes to some sort of political issue, then I feel like, oh, no, uh, no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm the other. Okay. These are the forces of change. I do not want to, I do not want to see them as threats, but these, these are the forces of change. Education, work, we're working together, we're playing sports together. Um, in schools, we come together. Um, there is, we attend others' ceremonies, religions, and so on. We, we learn languages across and so on and so forth. Uh, there's a lot of intermarriage. Uh, one of the, the fallouts, if you like, positive fallouts from the coup of 87 was increase in intermarriage. This is an observation that I've made. In the settlements around, you see a lot of uh, intermarriage. Um, we have multicultural neighborhoods. Uh, it's no longer people separated. They live together. So when somebody runs out of matches, runs across into his Indian neighbor and says, can I borrow your matches? And so on and so forth. Um, uh, we have the challenges of life are shared and um, changing lifestyles. Um, one of the uh, heartland of, of Indianness in Fiji is a place called Lambasa. Well, the Indian girls in Lambasa wear Fijian style dresses. Okay, and they wear it with pride. And the colors are very Fijian, the colors of their clothes. So yeah, so this is what we see happening here in Fiji. This portion here, is increasing and that has huge implications for identity now i have some some provocative questions there um is identity under threat threats appear in terms of political crisis separateness versus accommodation to what extent should we remain separate and to what extent should we work towards accommodation how much do we want to belong? There's an agency element in that. Okay. Um, we can feel that we are separate and different and better. That's the danger part, the last part. Once we begin to see ourselves as being better, then we are having going to have problems in relating to and, and, and it, it pose a threat to multiculturalism. Um, do we feel Fijian or Indian or Indo-Fijian? Like I said, at different times, I feel differently.
further points their political insistence on a separate identity in a plural society with political sensitivities. This is, a, this is the challenge. This is the biggest challenge that we face. Should we give up our identity? Can we give up our, can we give up our identity? Uh, to what extent should there be assimilation? And the migration phenomenon continues. We're leaving. So the threat is decreasing. The, the visible threat of the Indian presence in Fiji is decreasing. And the last question is, of course, a moot question. What direction should we take on identity? I hope um, I have, uh, you know, given you enough to, uh, to, ju to justify being here on this platform today. Thank you. Excellent, excellent. You have given us a lot of food for thought. Sir. Thank you very much. I'm going to go straight into taking questions for you, Dr. Shardanan Singh. Go ahead, please. You're muted. Okay. Thank you, Jalimaji. This is, this is also an excellent presentation. May I say this? The similarities between multiculturality in VG and in Suriname is just like saying, I'm Hindi people, I'm Haji Bhai, I'm Tempona. Problem is, you have spoken about we are struggling. Me too. I'm living here in Holland and we are struggling for the same. And the same is, what is our identity? You have uh, put two things uh, struggling for the identity versus nationality. You know, the Britain and the Portuguese has found the solution. And it is not versus, they are calling, you have a nationality? It's like, I have a Dutch nationality, a Britain, a French, or Fijian nationality, and I have a naturality. These two things, in Portugal, they are calling naturalidade e nacionalidade. The naturality and the nationality. These two mm. are two demands of the same person. I can live like a Dutchman with my Dutch passport, but I have a naturality. And my naturality is Hindustani. We are carrying tsunami. So the problem is now to find the acceptance. You know, in my study, in my book, I have met the very great man. Maybe you have heard about this. Eric David Durkheim. Do you know him? Maybe yeah. he is a French philosopher. Yeah, and social pedagogy. His his thesis, very very important thesis is: you can never build a sustainable uh, nation without recognizing the diversity. You have to work with the diversity. That is your starting point. And what is going on? in the colonial countries like Fiji and Suriname and, and Guyana and Trinidad is ignoring, ignoring the naturality. We all are Surinamese. We all are Guyanese. Are why, what is Guyanese? They are very different. So that's why I'm very happy to be a part of this night. And if you want, we can work together. I'm seeking partners to do research on this case. How? Can we uh, 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 get a, a homogeneity in the multiculturality? Because there is no heterogeneity in multiculturality. We are separated. Like a piece of cake, a cake, a cake. There is, in Hindi, they said, united in one, united in the first. That is the, 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 what Vedanta is learning us. But we are not one. We are separated. So how can we reach the point 
to be the Fijian Hindustani. Indian, I am not Indian. Really, I am not Indian. Okay, Dr. Sharanan, let's get a okay. response from Dr. Apana. Thank you. Okay. I'm not too sure if there was a need for a response, but uh, yeah, um, like I said, you know, it's uh, at different times we feel differently. And uh, uh, the, the bigger problem is that when we have a, a political environment where there is, um, there is always this possibility of pointing a finger at the other for problems arising, then we have problems. We have something to, to worry about. Said, yes. Oh, okay, thank you. Over time, the time will overcome this. That is never going to be. In the after the past 50 years in Suriname, we have seen you have to do something to reach the point of formal dignity. It is not coming spontaneously. Generation after generation, never it will come. Thank you, Dr. Sharanan. I hate to cut you, but uh, we do have two other speakers waiting, and we also have two other persons who have questions for Dr. Apanam. So let me just invite uh, Jay to please pose your question, and if we could do so very quickly, I would appreciate it. Go ahead, please. I, Mike, it won't be a question, a comment. It looks like these problems are in every colony that the colonial powers took us to. And it is the divide and rule principle that the British ruled, the British, the Portuguese, the French, the Spanish, they all use the same phenomena of dividing and ruling. So we, in our present day, we are still dividing and trying to rule each other or rule within the uh, confines of the nation. Now, I'll give you a classic example in Canada. We have a, the most multicultural society in the world because we've got people from north, south, east, and west of the world. We've got from Mongolia, we've got from uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, the Buddhists, we've got Chinese, you name it, we have it. Now, we are living in a most multicultural society, and we have guidelines that we work with. And I'm, I am a human rights activist and human rights teacher. So I know what happens in each culture, and I try to get to know them and then talk to them. You don't talk uh, what you call uh, down to them, you talk to them and talk with them and live with them. So what happens, you accommodate and you take the values of each culture. Well, that is what today's populism is doing, which we are going to fall a trap into. So be careful. The global community is has been indoctrinated by the four years of the person in the White House from the US. Populism is the one which is dividing us. So let us not go into that trap. As I said earlier in the comment to Sylvania, I am a Canadian because I took uh, citizenship in Canada, but of South Africa of Indian descent a Canadian South African of Indian descent living in Ontario. So if you live with that, you can talk to anybody, you walk with everybody and you work with everybody. That's all I can say. And yeah. if this is in the, the trail that this, uh, what you call panel is going, mm -hmm. let us get together because remember, united we stand, but divided will fall. And that is Thank when you very much, problems Jay. all over. Thank you very that's, much. That's my... excellent advice. Excellent yeah. advice. Thank you. We have a final question for Dr. Apana from Mr. Manak Bujwala. Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, uh, very good presentation, Subhashji. Uh, I like his uh, important point, you know, that once we start 
looking at ourselves as better than the others and expressing that, you know, in our communications, then we run into problem. So my question was, do you do they have interfaith organizations in Fiji and South Africa and Portugal that that might also help, you know, to be for people to listen to some authentic messages, you know, rather than from what they'll hear from their temple or church or mosque or whatever, which may not be the original messages of the prophets, uh, you know, and the original messages were everyone was telling prophets were saying to be truthful, kind, just justice, uh, compassion, all that and equality, you know, uh, but, uh, you know, we learned uh, some things that are not quite the same because they are interpreted differently by the leader. So my question was, are there interfaith organizations that can help? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, we do have interfaith organizations, but you see, the 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 there's another issue at play here. And increasingly, <clears throat> and this is a trend that I've noticed elsewhere as well. Our people, our younger generations, um, when they do something, when they engage in in something, there's a an instrumental orientation. They they seem to ask the question: Is this important? What will I gain from this? Um, to the extent that I've noticed that uh, our younger people don't say good morning openly, easily, or hello. Um, and they've forgotten the meaning of thank you. Okay. Now, these are small, small niceties that go a long way in, in forging those bonds across cultures. You know, old, old, uh, old school values that are now considered old school values. Yeah. Uh, this is all sort of on the way and it's going out. And and so you know we we are increasingly lo lo looking at people who are who are going to interact with you with an objective in mind. <laughs> to put it to put it very simply, it's common here too, <laughs> Dr. Alpana. <laughs> you would you would be surprised. It's common here too. So, anyways, your presentation was excellent. I want to thank you so much for your time and your expertise as well, and. Um, for all the questions that uh, and your responses. It's been an honor. I'll, I'll be back. <laughs> yes, you will. Okay, so let's move on to our third speaker now. And this is Professor Deva Kumarin of Reunion. He was born in Pondicherry in India, settled in Reunion Island. He speaks Tamil, writes poems and studied Tamil culture, French, French literature, history, and political science. And we are very pleased that he is going to attempt to do his presentation in English for our benefit. So welcome, sir. You can go ahead. Uh, good evening for all the past participants. You know, I am a, my English very, very, you know, very simple, but I try to speak in English. Uh, my personal life is, my birthplace is in uh, Pondicherry. Pondicherry was the capital of French India. India, you know, colonized by not, not only by British, also by Portuguese and by French. And uh, Pondicherry was the capital of French India. He, after the independence of Pondicherry in 1954, uh, some civil servants, like uh, uh, working in, uh, in French officer, like French officer, also in education, my father was professor and he came in reunion to teach French because he studied only French in Pondicherry. Hello, for the reunion I learned uh, Mauritius, so all the people know Mauritius, I think. Also. Uh, but reunion island, uh, not, I think. Because in reunion island is uh, just a French colony. Uh, it is my opinion. You know, I think uh, between uh, some difference between uh, uh, French colonization and English colonization. Uh, in French colony, uh, the French government uh, was not well, accepted, not accepted, to learn their mother tongue, their uh, keep their uh, culture, etc. Et uh, but if we compare Mauritius Island and Reunion Island, you can find in Mauritius uh, uh, Indian civilization, African civilization, but in Reunion, no, only French. 
Today is a changing, is a judgment today. In Reunion Island, you have the population that was this island was with other two islands and Guyana, you know, French Guyana, near the Suriname. Uh, it was a slavery. Uh, slavery was abolished in 19, uh, no, 1848. Abolition. After this abolition of slavery, uh, Tamils, particularly Tamils from uh, South India, particularly from Pondicherry and uh, other French territory, Karika, they come to Reunion Island. After the arrival, uh, they forgot the, all their culture, uh, they forgot their mother tongue. Uh, among this population, you have, you have also majority of this population is Tamil. Also, we have some Telugus, Tamilis, etc. And they come there and uh, the civilization, uh, Indian civilization, they forgot all the Tamil, uh, Tamil language, Tamil uh, culture, Tamil language in particular. After uh, some years after, uh, when, uh, in 1917, uh, 1917 only, 76, they start, this Indian Tamil culture start in, in Reunion Island. Why? Because the advocate, the Tamil advocate, his name is Rene Krishnan, they come to, this is a reunion people, he was born in reunion. After his studies in French, he came to reunion, returned to reunion island, and he started a newspaper, for the first time the newspaper in 1960, he's named the Trido, French newspaper, for, for the Tamils in reunion island. Some people, some young people began to learn Tamil, not, not Hindi, not Gujarati. What also I would like to say, you have the Gujarati people in Reunion Island. Uh, but all the Gujarati people is, are in business. They are coming from Gujarat, a very rich. They have, they keep, they kept, they keep also today, their culture, their religion, but because there are all Muslims. But in, 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 in Reunion Island, you have temples, into temples, particular Tamil temples. But to the particularity of the Tamils in Reunion Island, uh, they, they forget also their culture, uh, but also for me, it is very important. They forget their caste system. They have no caste system. And but, but because uh, may, uh, otherwise uh, their religion is a mixed religion, two religions, Catholics, uh, Christians, and Hindus. Friday they go to in temples, Sunday they go to church. No, the, we have also mixed in. Uh, uh, very they start to to learn to know their culture and their language after 1966. And 1967, professor of Tamil, Mr. Sangili, is a grad professor in Mauritius Island. He came to Reunion Island to teach Tamil. We are in very, very little school, small school, near the Hindu temple, Tamil Hindu temple, near Saint Denis. Saint Denis is the capital of Reunion Island. He started. And I, I was, my, but I speak also today Tamil because I was born in Pondicherry. I came with my par parents, particularly with my father, who was a teacher in Reunion Island. For this region, and I can speak also today Tamil. I was very vexed, I was very disappointed to find these people coming from Tamil Nadu. They forgot everything, everything, language, culture, uh, also address only they are keeping the cook to cook uh, Indian meals, Tamil meals, uh, curry kurma and uh, biryani, uh, mutton kurma, etc. 
and Mr. Uh, Rani Krishna was start. He, he began to uh, to publish a credit in his paper, name is Freedom. And I, in 1970, I published the French Tamil booklet, written book, very booklet. His name is, in French, J'apprends le Tamil. Translated if in English, uh, I learned Tamil. But after this, I came to France and I uh, met the relations with, uh, with uh, Reunion Island. We, some, also today, you know, uh, regrettable for, for a Reunion Island, I think for in Mauritius is more, uh, uh, the culture is more, is present uh, Indian culture, but in my reunion and is uh, not not existing. Uh, frankly, I, I, that's my opinion. Frankly, you know, is a mixed culture, more French culture, French and Creole. They speak all the people in reunion. They speak uh, Creole, not French Creole, Creole reunion Creole. Between difference between Mauritius Creole and Re uh, reunion Creole. Uh, today they have the relations. They go regularly. Some Tamils, off Union Island, they go to India, to South India. But uh, I think, I think, you know, what the uh, Reunion is a French territory. You know? uh, the money is a French money. It's the euro. Uh, the, the style of life is French. Uh, uh, <laughs> economically, Reunion is a, is a, is a one of the rich islands in Indian Ocean. Uh, for this reason, uh, um, Indian origin, Tamil origin, prefer, uh, uh, term, prefer France, uh, forget India on, uh, for me, <laughs> that's uh, I think. Also, I, I, I arrive today. Today in the Reunion Island, we have no newspaper for the Indian people, <laughs> you know. Uh, I, I that's uh, my, I think uh, you know also Indians in the also in India and after outside in India uh, they are very interested by by the study like engineer doctors not very interested by journalism by literature uh, example in Reunion Island we have no a writer. Tamil origin, Indian origin, don't know. In French, also in French. Also, if take near uh, uh, near America, uh, two islands you know very well, uh, French islands, Guadeloupe and Martinique. They are also you have Indians, but in this island, also you have no writers. You know, uh, I think uh, in South Africa, no. Very important. in France, uh, some association going are going to celebrate uh, Mahatma Gandhi in, in October. I think it's very important for us all the Indian diaspora uh, to learn Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi. You know, when he came to uh, to South Africa, uh, he found also the, all the population. You know, the Mahatma Gandhi is from Gujarat. Uh, mother tongue is Gujarati. But in South Africa, I think they he, 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 he teached uh, uh, Tamil for the Tamil children. But uh, Tamil parents, <laughs> uh, they forgot uh, Tamil, their uh, Tamil language. Yeah? Uh, but, but for this reason, uh, I think also today, you have no, for example, I take uh, Reunion Island, you have no filmmakers. Uh, we have not journalists, we have not, uh, we have not uh, poets, writers. Also in French, I don't say in Tamil or Hindi. Uh, I think I don't, I cannot translate exactly what you mean, uh, Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi said, said, Indian people uh, like make money. Uh, I'll also, also accept all the uh, bad thing from other people, but they, they, they like to make money. One, he was, he was Africa, you know. <laughs> uh, that's the way Mahatma Gandhi said. Uh, in Reunion Island, I regret too much. Uh, 
the people uh, have the contacts with India, with Indian culture, not like for, uh, for Mauritius. Mauritius, Indian culture is very important uh, today also. But in Reunion Island, no. Because it is a French territory, that's a French politics. French politics is quite different between French politics and uh, British politics, you know. Uh, British, I think, British uh, support sometimes uh, in their colonies, uh, former colonies. They support the local culture, but uh, French in French colonies, uh, it is very difficult to find the culture of the people. Uh, but I could say, although I, I don't say if you understand my English, <laughs> it's a problem for me. Uh, I stop with my speech. I would like to answer uh, to our questions. It is very important, I think. Thank you very much for all the participants. Yeah, thank you so much. And yes, your English was quite good, actually. <laughs> so um, until I see some raised hands, let me just ask you this. If I were to come to reunion today, would I find an Indian restaurant to eat at? Uh, Indian restaurant? Yes. Ah, you have Indian restaurant. Ah, yeah, yeah. Indian restaurant. Uh, uh, Indian restaurant for uh, not Indians. Uh, they cook, but they like biryani also. Biryani, samosa, uh, uh, South Indians meals, you know, vadai. Vadai. Also, no, you have, mm -hmm. you have Indian restaurant in there. And does the Indian have restaurant, the, the, the director of Indian restaurant are the North Indians, not South Indians. <laughs> They are, because Nanta. they are coming for, from Gujarat, and mm -hmm. also they are coming the Gujarat people from Malagasy, you know, Madagascar, Malaga Republic of Malagasy. Oh, Madagascar. Okay. Madagascar. You have then you have uh, some uh, Gujarati mm -hmm. people before, not today. Mm -hmm. And does the average indoor reu um, uh, reunion citizen of Indian descent does that person know music by Muhammad Rafi, Lata Mangeshkar, and so on? Yeah, question is very important. Very, the first uh, uh, film, Indian films, but particularly Tamil film, was screened in the reunion in 1970. Before, no, you know, 1970. After today, you know, with uh, internet, uh, radio, you have you know, say, listen, yeah, yeah, Indian. Particularly, the, also if North Indian music and South Indian music, yeah. Also, Indian movies, also, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, very good, yeah. <laughs> so, I'm sure Mr. Nair has um, an interesting question for you, too. Go ahead, please. <laughs> Just a, a little enlightening. Nice presentation, good English, no problem. Uh, we, we <laughs> und I understood everything. Yeah. And uh, as far as Mahatma Gandhi is concerned, he came and learned a lot in South Africa because when he left London, yeah, uh, I'm a student of uh, Mahatma Gandhi. I studied yeah. him. Yeah. I'm studying him still. Yeah, right, he, yeah. When he left London, he felt because he held a British passport, yeah, yeah. he felt he was Indian and he was a British person. So he came to South Africa, it was a road awakening. And uh, part of Gujarati and all that, he, in his Phoenix settlement, he had language yeah, instruction yeah, yeah. and we were involved, the Tamil, I'm yeah. South Indian. So my brother and my uh, uncles and aunts and so on were also part of the movement. And uh, he did allow teaching of Tamil and Telugu and Hindi and so on. Yeah, yeah. Now, when the time he left South Africa, that's where the business community, and that is how we ended up with two organizations, the Natal Indian Congress, which is working class, and the South African Indian organization, where they're made up of all the, the Muslim traders, the Gujarati businessmen, and so on. So there was a division already created in South Africa between the Indians. So having said that, he did, he did a lot for us. He set the stage and today we freed South Africa under the apartheid regime under British rule. 
uh, broke away from the British, uh, you know, what we call the colonial system. But it's still a long way to go. I, I'm, I'm in the departure lounge. So what will happen next is youngsters like the, uh, uh, what's the Vanya, that's the generation will have to pick up the cudgels and go forward. And you are right. We have to find our identity properly. And as I ended the last time, I said, united we stand together and divided we're going to fall. And they'll use us. And in a populous nations of the world today, we are you know, for the picking. And opportunists will be all over. So good presentation, and you know I understand what Pondicherry. I went to Guadeloupe, and I saw around, ah, yeah. and I see these things. Ah, yeah. But also, you know, uh, you, uh, in India, you are also not only Mahatma Gandhi. In South India, you have a lot of uh, great leaders and philosophers like uh, Periyar and another. Right? Uh, they fight very strongly against. Uh, uh, religious fanatism and uh, caste system in South India. Do you know? Uh, yeah, I heard South of India, Periyar. Chennai, I Chennai, heard Tamil of Nadu, right? yeah. Oh, yeah. Periyar and uh, another uh, yeah. last century. Uh, they are more uh, very, very, very fight. I think that is very Indian people. Uh, also, the diaspora Indian people, you know. We can fight for, against the Fanati, religious fanatism and caste system. It is a, that is my opinion, very strongly. Uh, the future of India, future, good future for India, one, India to becomes a, for different human rights and humanity. For the, that's my opinion. No? You, no, India, is, right I respect you. very well uh, Swami Vivekananda. Yeah. Swami Vivekananda. For him, religion is in, in our heart. That's right. Meant, huh, I, but the Indian people uh, sometimes not understand very good, very well uh, the ideal of Swami Vivekananda. Yeah. This year is you know is a 130 uh, anniversary, 30th anniversary of the French first parliament in Chicago, oh. first internal years. French Parliament Interreligious uh, Conference, first in 1903, uh, first conference in Chicago, hmm. with the particip participation of uh, Swami Vivekananda today. I am writing some articles in French on this anniversary. Yeah. It is very important to <laughs> sometime also conference on the Swami Vivekananda and other uh, Indian leaders also is very, very important to talk. I don't know what you think about uh, Swami Vivekananda. I appreciate him. I uh, appreciate his ideal, uh, his uh, all the ideas also. It's, it, it's something to study, that's all. Yeah. That's my piece. <laughs> Yes, thank you. Um, Jay, thank you very much for your question. Professor Kumaran, uh, your um, presentation was excellent and we really appreciate you speaking about your personal background, sharing that with us. It was very valuable and I'm sure a number of people in the audience would like to interact with you to discuss Swami Vivekananda. So with your permission, we would share your um, email address if anybody asks. Is that okay? Professor Kumaran? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Sir. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, but I could say more. I uh, am yeah, very happy to, to do this conference. Mm -hmm. Very, very happy. Uh, if you would like to touch, you know, uh, all the reunion people, you know, they speak French. You cannot be a participant. In, like this conference, okay. uh, sometime I think, I think, I think uh, it is very important also to uh, 
B language, French and English are other language, no? which translation is a, as you know, we, it is not possible to, to yeah. contact the, these people, no? they're very, very difficult. Uh, we have also, no, don't forget uh, that we have Indians in uh, Indian diaspora is very important also in Guadeloupe and Martinique Island. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. But in uh, 50 years, you cannot help these islands. Uh, you have no Indian civilization, Indian culture in these islands. <laughs> That's uh, very important to, to help uh, the Indian culture in these islands, very important. This is our duty. I think yes. it's very difficult, but our duty. Yes, you are right. It is our duty. And I thank you so much for bringing that point. So thank you very much for having um, contributed to this program. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we move on now to our fourth and final speaker who has been patiently waiting. And this is Dr. Arnold Thomas of St. Vincent. He is the author of the monograph entitled The Argyle Chronicles, From Home to East Indians. He's a member of the Indian Diaspora Council and the Global Grumetia Society and so many other things we could say about him. I'll just cut it short because I want to hear his presentation. Welcome, Dr. Thomas. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. And I have a competition with my doggy. Uh, just, just give me oh. It's actually greeting somebody passing by the gate. Anyway, thank you very much for having me on the program again. And it's been very, very interesting and exciting listening to the last three speakers about <clears throat> Indian identity. And what in the, in, in the brief comments I have to make, what I want to say to begin with is that we in St. Vincent and the Grenadines have a rather different history of uh, Indian culture and everything else. So let me just set a little background here about St. Vincent and Grenadines. We have gone through several periods, unlike most of the countries that have had Indians. First of all, St. Vincent was occupied, the indigenous people were called Garifuna or Kalinago. And when, when, um, when slavery started, the British wanted the island to grow sugarcane. And they found that the, the Garifuna or Kalinago were in the way. So they set about, from about 1763, they had about three wars. And the last one ended in 1797, when they completely committed genocide, obliterated the indigenous Garifuna population. So having got rid of them, well, those who weren't killed were shipped off to this island in, um, off the Bay of Honduras. And today, their their descendants in in Nicaragua, in in in, in, um, in um, uh, Honduras, in, and in Belize. So that was the end of that. So having got rid of the indigenous people, they now brought in Africans and slave. It took a while from 1797 um, for them for, for for them to set up to establish this um, slavery society. Slavery society actually lasted a very short time compared with other Caribbean countries in which there was African slavery because uh, um, the slave trade was abolished in 1807. Slavery was actually abolished in 1838. And when slavery was abolished again, the plantation owners needed people to work. So what was the, what was the issue? They had to turn to other countries because a lot of the freed blacks didn't want to work on the estates. And so they had to turn to other um, supplies of labor. So when the first they turned to the Portuguese island of Madeira and they brought in a number of Madeirans under the system of indentureship, right? And so indentured Madeirans came to St. Vincent from about 1845 to 1861, just over 2000 came. That was not enough. They still needed people to work plantations at the time. You know, uh, indentureship was already established in other Caribbean countries like Trinidad and Guyana. So St. Vincent wanted their own share. And it was not until 1861 when Indian indentureship was finally introduced into St. Vincent. Now, uh, <clears throat> again, in keeping with, with, with the subject matter, 
the plantation owners here did not want madrasis, and madrasis had a reputation at the time in the Caribbean for being violent. So they didn't want madrasis. However, the only people available to them in 1861 were madrasis. So the first ship that came to St. Vincent was a shipment of madrasis, <clears throat> about 260. And later, there were seven shiploads, all coming from, a, from Calcutta. And as you mentioned in your introduction, there were um, 2474 Indians in all that came to St. Vincent. They came to St. Vincent and the madrasis were very good models for them. They worked, they worked, they worked very well. Um, <clears throat> the Indians continue to work, but this is something we have to remember when we look at um, indentureship in, 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 in the Caribbean and the impact on culture and all that kind of stuff. When in, by the time the Indians came here, there was established a system of apprenticeship. An apprenticeship was just another, for, in terms of the conditions on the estate, it was just another form of slavery. I know one of people like you think of refer to indentureship as a new form of slavery. So when the Indians came here, although they were allowed to keep their, their language, their culture, their religion, everything else, on the estate, they had to work under conditions almost similar, if not identical, to the African slaves. And they were not being paid. So <clears throat> there was problems, there was problems on the estate from the very beginning. Things came to a head in 1882 when Indians were not being paid. They had uh, uh, all kinds of um, sicknesses and illnesses, and they were not being looked after according to their, their contracts. Um, so what they did, they decided that was enough. They downed Cutlass and Hope. And in 1882, on the main estate in St. Vincent, they had most of the Indians. Um, some 50 of them marched barefooted from the estate to the capital Kingstown to bring their protests, to bring their grievances to the governor general. That was in 1882. Well, things not, did, did not go very well um, in this march because seven of the ringleaders were arrested. However, when the colonial office in London heard about what had happened, they said, no, you have to give back these people the promise. The promise was that when they serve their time, they want to get a free passage back to India. In the meantime, what the plantation rulers have tried to do was to keep them in St. Vincent and to make them feel that they were part of the Vincentian culture and societies. What did they do? First of all, the churches were very, very, very um, upfront in terms of preaching that Hinduism was idolatry. And all those Hindus who came here who, were, who believe in Hinduism, they would, go, they, would, they, would, they would go to hell unless they become Christians. So beginning with the 1860s, all the churches were strongly buying to, 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 to confirm uh, the Indians into becoming Christians. In 1867, things got real, real bad because what happened when Indian children were being baptized by one church, the other church said, no, 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 like the Anglican church said, no, you can't do this because they had, they had the, uh, the, the priority. So what they did, they rebaptized the Indian children. So what was happening in the, in the, in the meantime, in those first couple of years? Um, Indian children were being baptized as Christians. They were given names after the white overseers and drivers. So that was the beginning of the end of the loss of the Indian names. Okay, so the Indian names slowly went out from the 1960s. Also, the religion went on very slowly because after the 1882 march, the protest march, and incidentally, um, let me just mention that the, the, the protest march, I've written a chapter in the book called um, We Mark Your Memory, which was published by the University of London. It, it, de it details the protest march in 1882 and what happened, what was the impact on the Indian community in St. Vincent. After 1882, things went downhill. And the Indian, the, the colonial government in England said, look, if you can't find work for these people and treat them the way they should be treated under their contract, send them back to India. So in 1883-84, there was a massive flux, uh, uh, outpouring, uh, um, 
the Indians who incidentally, they tried to get back to India. And since the colonial government want to give back the promise to send them back without having to pay their duty. So by 18, by 1885, over 1100, 1184 Indians from the population in Simpson were sent back to India. And that was more or less um, what happened to most of the Indians that came here. So in the meantime, from then on, what happened? Those Indians who remained, they had to make themselves uh, to become part of the local co uh, Creole cultural society. So what they had to do, they became Christians, they gave up their Indian names, and of course, they had to do everything. And they even lost a lot of the, the loss of the, the things like the cuisine because Indians also, um, initially they were accustomed to curried food, but that, that also went out. In terms of dressing, all of that went. So by 1890, you could say, you could, you could say that the Indians had more or less lost their culture. Um, most of the, most of the Indians were settled on one estate called Argyle. And when they were there, they had become part of the Creole society in St. Vincent. They had lost almost everything Indian, except, you know, they were still being called coolies, incidentally, and it was mentioned before, the Indians who came here under indentureship, under the race column, they were, they were, they were headed, they, they were labeled coolies. So we became coolies very early in the game, not Indians, we became coolies. So all the coolies were living on this main estate called Argyle. And when the estate was being sold in the 1920s, over 200 Indians living there, they were told to get off the estate because the they, they, they new owners would, know, would, would, would treat them as squatters. So they have to get off, sell whatever they had, whether it's some, uh, uh, some uh, um, cattle or, or sheep or goats or whatever, and buy their own property. And this is where I would tell you, this is one part of our Indian history we are very proud of. Our people who lived in Argyle Estate, they got together and bought chunks of estates close by. And they formed, they moved off from Argyle Estate and formed Indian villages known as Calder, Acres, and Richland Park. And these became the main Indian villages in St. Vincent. But just to remind you what I said earlier, by the time they moved to Calder, and Acres and Richmond Park, there were many Christians. And the 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 change in in, a, in religion continued in the 1930s, and even bigger change took place because this religion called Seventh Day Adventism took over from uh, took over one Indian family in particular, and that family became the focus for almost all the Indians in that particular village becoming Seventh Day Adventists. As a matter of fact, most of the, I would say most, if not all, it's not all because I'm not a Seventh-day Adventist. A lot of the Indians and Sanderson are Seventh-day Adventists. So that was, that was the story right up to the 1930s. Then comes the 1950s and 60s when there was this big rush to join the group and get out of St. Vincent to go to England because of the new Cumberland Immigration Act. So, all those villages, Calder, Acres, and Richmond Park, with all with most of the Indians, the Indians decided they had enough. There was not enough going on in St. Vincent. They packed up and jumped on the train or, or the plane and headed for England. And that was the deterioration, the further deterioration, and disestablishment of Indian communities in St. Vincent. Now, all of this happened. And now, let me just jump in here and tell you, I didn't know much about Indian history. In 1992, I was back in England doing some research. And I came, and while I was there, I was in 92, 92, 94, I came across a very distinguished person that you've mentioned, Professor Brinsley Samaru. And Brinsley saw me, uh, heard me doing my research about Indian indentureship in St. Vincent, and told me about a conference that was coming up in Trinidad. And that was the first occasion I had the opportunity to, come, to go to a conference and talk about what I've just said about Indians in St. Vincent. So from about the 1990s, there was a revival of Indian culture and everything else. Um, to jump ahead, uh, how am I doing for time? Um, Five okay. minutes. Okay, I, uh, to, to jump ahead, from the 1990s 
things began to develop because I wrote a number of things asking people to get involved in forming an Indian Heritage Foundation. And it actually, it actually took place in 2006 when the few Indians in St. Vincent got together. And thanks to the advice from folks like yourself from Trinidad and, and Guyana, they formed the, the St. Vincent and the Grenadines Indian Heritage Foundation. And that was the beginning of something new again in St. Vincent. Just truly, when I came back to live in St. I was living in, in um, well, between England and, and, uh, and, and, and Europe in Brussels. When I came back here, I was invited by one of the radio stations to start my own program called Indo Vincentian Culture and Society, or Indo Vincentian, or it was actually called. So for two years, I, 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 I was heading that program and I tried to bring back not just the history, but a little bit of Indian culture. We talk about the festivals, we talk about the religion and a number of other things. And finally, in 2007, in 2007, um, there was a visit from India by, um, he was the Minister of External Affairs at the time in 2007. And when he came in, we were very, we were very happy to meet him. And that again, put another spore into, 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 into um, re rediscovering Indian culture and Indian identity. So um, thanks to the government also in St. Vincent, the 1st of June was recognized as Indian Arrival Day. And the 7th of October, which was the date of the protest march from Argyle to Kingston, was recognized as Indian Heritage Day. And I've just got word from the ambassador in Suriname, who's also ambassador to St. Vincent, that is coming here. And although he's leaving on the 8th of October, he's or something like he is asking for the celebration of Indian Indian Heritage Day to be brought forward one day to uh, maybe October the 6th. So since 2007, we have had a number of developments like we've been involved in your program in a number of international regional conferences, bringing back Indian culture. But, you know, um, unlike the, the, the former three speakers, we have lost the language, we have lost the religion, we have lost the names. And we are all, as one, one minister described our culture in St. Vincent, we have a tapestry of, we have a tapestry of culture. It's a mix of everything. The Garifuna were left, the Africans came, the Madeirans came, the Indians came. So we have a tapestry of culture in St. Vincent. And what we have learned to do is to live together as one people. But now we are rediscovering again Indian culture and all of that. So we celebrate Diwali, some of us anyway. We celebrate an Indian festival. Um, never mind some 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 religions still look down on Hinduism as idolatry. But we and thanks to your program and another for the, uh, other programs, we are getting back there and we are becoming Indians. And let me just end up by saying, for us, India is all has always been a state of mind. So although we might have lost a number of things, we say we're Indians. And even though we are called coolies sometimes, we don't care. We are Indians and we're proud of it and we remain Indians and we'll always be Indians. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Thomas. And um, would you believe the very first Indian diaspora conference I ever attended was that one which you all held, you and Dr. Kumar Mahabir had organized in St. Vincent. That's so it right. was the first conference for me, yeah. I remember that. Uh, if, you, if you see this, this this is the book that we'll be talking about. It's it's actually a synopsis of what happened on Argyle Estate in the 1920s until the building of the Argyle International Airport, which is now uh, a big thing in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Yeah. But yeah. Argyle for us is also a state of mind. And Argyle <laughs> is linked with India intrinsically and, and in many other respects because that's where most of the Indians were kept after indentureship. Mm -hmm. Yes, excellent. Let's take a question from D Dipti Agarwal. Dipti, go ahead. You want to unmute your mic, please. Very good lecture, Arnold Thomas. Very informative. My question to everyone, because there is no colonialism nowadays, no Spanish, no French, no Dutch, no British. Can we get our, uh, is there any solution so that we can get back our old identity, our Indianness, our religion, our language back? Is there any solution? 
because yes. India is in is in our heart. Everybody's heart. Yes, let me. But let me tell you, um, we are not. We mean this in the the SPG Indian Heritage Foundation. Also, the SPG government is now working very very closely with the Indian government, and we have a number of programs because Saint Vincent has sent a lot of students already to India. And when they are, they of course, have to learn some of the Indian dialects, you know, whether it's Bhojpuri or, 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 or Hindi. So they're getting back there. A lot of them coming back here, they could come back and talk about Indian culture, the things we have lost. So to answer your question, yes, we're, we're getting into it. And like you said, we have, we have very close contact with Suriname, where the Indian ambassador is located. And he comes here, our census people, very often, uh, whatever, and he's always telling me, and I'm in touch with him personally, he said, He's always telling us, he's always asking us to tell them what they would like to do for us to bring back Indian heritage and culture. So we, we get in there. Never mind, me, never mind me, not unlike the other people go back to Hinduism and all the rest of it. But like I said, it's a state of mind and we, the, Indian, the Indian in us, they can never, never take away. When the people talk to you about our Indian culture, about Hindi language, in Hindi you speak, we feel very proud of you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, great. So that was excellent, Dr. Thomas, as always. I'm not seeing any further hands, but um, you've given us an extremely good historical backdrop, which we knew you would, um, you would do. And um, thank you so much, as always, for your being here. My pleasure. So ladies and gentlemen, we are one minute to five, and that's when we should end the program. At this point, I just want to reiterate that this is not a new issue. Establishing our ethnic identity is something that we have to deal with, but it was the same for our indentured forefathers. I mean, can you just imagine their situation coming here into this, these, territories, these colonial territories, under the situations in which they had to live and among the people in which they had to live, they also had to deal with ethnic identity issues. And by virtue of the fact that we are here and we can still identify ourselves as Indo something, Indo some place, they did a fantastic job. Otherwise we would never have known Indian wear, Indian clothes, Indian food, um, names, our names would have been lost, etc. So hats off to them as always. And um, to those of us who are in the diaspora who continue to do the work that we do. Yes, Dr. Thomas. Yeah, no, sorry, I should mention two things. Um, yours truly, I've just been invited by the government to become part of a reparation committee. And you, you've had your program already on reparations. And what we are saying that just like we talk of reparations for slavery and genocide, we should also have reparation for indentureship because as I mentioned earlier in my talk, apprenticeship that came out of slavery was, was, was what indentureship was all about in St. Vincent. Um, so, and the second, the other, well, those are the two things. One, I'm, I'm part of that, um, I'm part of that committee. I'm part of that committee. And are we also talking about reparation and we want to get, we want to make sure that in, uh, uh, rep, reparations would be all, would also be for those who are indentured or indentorship. Yes, and congratulations again on that appointment. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, for those of you who um, can't do so, you can probably look back at the uh, YouTube channel of the Indo-Caribbean Cultural Center and look for that conversation that we had on reparations. I see Professor Kumaran with his hand up. Is it that you would like to ask a question? You can unmute. You'll need to unmute. Okay. Yes, we're hearing you now. Uh, I would like to, to all my thanks eh, for you. Excuse me for my English. No, all the French people eh, they don't speak very well English. Uh, it is uh, very important to keep contact with us, and also uh, that's my opinion. You know, India is going to in uh, twenty years. Uh, India, I, I am sure, 
this country had become a very great country, you know. That was dream, you know, Sri Aurobindo, Aurobindo, great philosopher. His dream was one day, uh, India, I am sure you know, in 20, 10 years, we Indians from diaspora, we, we have job for the singer. You know, money, system, etc. But uh, diaspora, Indian, I think is very rich. <laughs> but we have also to transfer our ideal, our idea about the women rights and uh, women, the religious uh, harmony of religions. It is very, they come from diaspora Indian, very important. But because the Indian diaspora in other countries, in the middle of the, all the religions of the languages, you know, for India, uh, I think India is waiting, waiting diaspora people. That's my opinion, I think. It is very important for us. Uh, we are also waiting from India, but we, we are, can, could keep something for India, you know. Okay, Dr. Kumaran, I think you've muted yourself. system okay Sorry, yeah. right. mm -hmm. for the very thanks i would like to keep with contact with you huh? uh, that is very important also we, we can we could do uh, something for india very very important india yeah. is very very important country for me huh? not mm -hmm. only in economically right? india in the world is a great country is still very active. very very important to say only one country in the world Spirituality. Spirituality is not religion. Spirituality is by heart, thinking by heart for okay. the future of the world. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so much for your contributions. And at this point in time, I want to bring today's program to a close. I want to thank all of our speakers. You've made invaluable contributions and we really appreciate you sharing your time, your knowledge and your expertise with us. We kind of thank you enough. So I'll turn you over now to Shakira, the chair, who will bring today's session to our former groups. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Shalama, and thank you all for taking the time to participate and to attend. And as we said earlier, this public meeting is being hosted by the Indo-Caribbean Cultural Center, and you can feel free to contact the ICC to publish your books and your reports. And remember that we are asking you to kindly give us your suggestions volunteerism and as well as donations and can, can contact Dr. Mahabir for details. We want to thank the advisory and planning team led by Dr. Kumar Mahabir and our IT manager behind the scenes, Ravan Ramsey, who has been recording the program and will upload it to our website and YouTube permanently for posterity and also to Miriam Mohammed for producing our TikTok videos. Our topic next Sunday will be conversations with Indian elders in East Africa. Something to look forward to. So please visit our YouTube channel to see all our past recordings. I am Shakira Mohammed from Trinidad and Tobago saying goodbye. May God bless you all. Thank you.